Shane here with University of Ultrasonics in Houston. This will be the first in a series of videos in which we'll discuss our transition from analog to digital UT instruments and also explore several of the core principles involved during the digitization process. Um, the discussion will span across several different techniques, including phase array, TFM, and Toft. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. Stay tuned and we'll be right back. So from the way that we listen to our music, to the way that we watch our movies, to the electronics that are in our house, uh, TVs, cameras, telephones, uh, radio stations, TV stations, over the course of the past 20 or 30 years, we've seen a shift from analog to digital across all the media that we use in our everyday lives. And our ultrasound instruments that we use for UT testing have shown the same transition. So we started out using the analog UT instruments. They had uh, small CRT screens with really high resolution A scans, uh, manual pulser and receiver controls, knobs and buttons. Um, they required AC power or large battery packs. Um, there was limited on-screen functionality until later models. Uh, your measurements were taken by analyzing your signal position on the screen. You didn't have any readings to help you out, so you had to be pretty good at what you were doing. Um, DAC curves were often drawn directly on the screen by hand until later models came around. Uh, you had limited to no onboard data storage. Uh, they require frequent recalibrations, but they got the job done for a long time. About 20 years or so ago, give or take, uh, we transitioned to the digital instruments that we're all familiar with today. Uh, they have the, the bright high resolution uh, displays, you've got onboard data storage and data logging capabilities, you've got digital processing options like gain and gates and your readings, uh, they're computer controlled and the software is upgradable. Uh, low power internal battery components, they're battery power, they've got really clean signals, you've got digital DAC curves and TCGs, data saving capabilities. Uh, you can analyze and review the data after the fact. Um, you've got software manipulation to uh, create a lot of different images based off of your raw A-scan data, so like phased array, um, and they maintain calibrations better than analog units. So. To think about going from analog to digital, uh, we start out with an analog A scan at the receiver. That's how the sound is in its natural form. We convert the time base uh, and the precision that we get there is based on our digitization frequency. We'll, we'll talk about that later. We also have to convert the amplitude to digital and uh, the bit rate or bit depth of the instrument is gonna be in charge of that. And depending on the settings that we use, we can get an A scan that has a really low resolution or maybe one that has a really high resolution. And we're gonna talk about those settings as we go on. So to break down and think about how we digitize our A scans, we have to break our waveform down to the smallest possible unit, and that's gonna be a cycle. So one full oscillation of a wave is called a cycle. You got a positive displacement and a negative displacement. Uh, to me, a cycle is a really good representation of Sir Isaac Newton's third law of motion that states for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Um, on the graph on the bottom, you see uh, the blue line represents a sine wave in which the positive and negative amplitudes are identical. Um, in actuality, the red version down there, the Gaussian wave, is a more true representation of uh, the way that our A-scan signals look. But uh, Gaussian wave math and science, it's a little bit more high end for our needs here. So most of the simple calculations that we're going to deal with uh, we're going to deal with uh, sine waves. So, uh, but again, a Gaussian wave is, is a little bit more accurate, but that math gets pretty hard. We're not trying to do that here. So again, uh, we've got a cycle. The length across a cycle is called a wavelength. The time that it takes to complete one cycle is called a period, and there's two very simple math formulas there. V over F for wavelength and one divided by the frequency for your period. So we can calculate both of those if we wanted to. I've got an example here, five meg carbon steel L wave. We've got a wavelength of about 46 thousandths or 1.2 millimeters. Uh, and we got a period of 0.2 microseconds. So we'll remember that 0.2 microseconds. We're gonna use that in a few slides. Um, we have a, an analog to digital conversion that's performed at some kind of regular interval that's gonna be driven by our digitization frequency. Um, every analog to digital conversion gives us a digital sample. Uh, every sample contains time and amplitude information. So the digitization frequency refers to how many analog to digital samples we get per second. 
Uh, we don't want to confuse this with our probe frequency. This is analog to digital samples per second, not cycles per second. So some common uh, frequencies are 25, 50, and 100 megahertz. Um, the digitization frequency we use should be based on one, the transducer frequency, and two, how many samples we might be required to get for whatever code or procedure we're working to. Some codes do direct us in a certain way. We'll talk about that in a later video. In order to faithfully represent that original analog waveform in both terms of amplitude and timing, um, the digitized signal has to be as true as possible to that original analog. This is something that we call fidelity. So we've got amplitude fidelity and timing fidelity. The higher the digitization frequency, the better our fidelity, the better the A-scan resolution, but also the slower the scanning speed and the larger the data file. We'll talk about those kind of things later on. Depending on our digitization frequency, we could grab just a few samples per period, or if we use a faster rate, we could get a few more, or we could get a lot more depending on the frequency. Um, the higher the digitization frequency, the more samples we get, and the better the resolution and our fidelities, again, are going to be. But, but um, you know, again, the more samples we get, the slower the scanning speed and the bigger the data file. But we're interested in signal quality here. Uh, fidelity refers to how accurately our digital signal represents the original, and we'll talk more about that later. So depending on the digitization frequency, we're going to grab a sample at some kind of regular interval. Um, the formula for calculating uh, this interval between samples is 1 divided by the digitization frequency. So if we take the example of 25 megahertz, 1 over 25 is going to tell us there's 0 0.04 microseconds in between each one of these samples. Uh, remember that number, we're going to use this on the next slide. Um, the sample rate that we refer to usually refers to how many samples per period we get. So the formula is period divided by interval. Uh, if we use examples from those previous slides, we can show that a 0.2 microsecond period divided by a uh, 0.04 microsecond interval resulted in five samples per period. Um, we can notice a, a math relationship here. A digitization frequency equal to five times the probe frequency gave me five samples per period. Uh, 25 megahertz digitizing frequency equals five megahertz times five samples per period. Or we could say 25 megahertz digitizing frequency divided by a 5 megahertz probe frequency gives us five samples per period. I use this triangle in my classes a lot to represent mathematical relationships between uh, three different values. So basically, whatever's on top of the triangle, if you divide that by one of the things on the bottom, you're going to get the other thing on the bottom. And also, if you multiply the two values on the bottom, you get the top value. So let's see how that works out. If we've got a digitization frequency of 25 megahertz, and we're using a probe frequency of 5 megahertz. Divide those two, we're going to get five samples per period. If we've got 100 megahertz for the digitizing frequency, and we're using a 5 megahertz probe frequency, divide those, and we're going to get a sampling rate of 20 samples per period. If we know that we've got a 5 megahertz probe, and say we, we know for whatever reason we want to get five samples per period, multiply those, you'll see that you need a digitization frequency of 25 megahertz to get that done. And one more, if we have a probe frequency of 10 megahertz, multiply that by a sampling rate of five samples per period, and you'll see that you need a 50 megahertz digitizing frequency to get that done. So that's how this works. The triangle, I feel, is a pretty simple way to navigate that. I use that for a number of different things in my classes. So uh, this is the first video, like I said. Uh, there's a lot of things that I want to cover, and it's going to take way more than one video in 10 minutes to do. So this might be three or four or five videos when it's all said and done. We're going to travel through a variety of different techniques as we talk about this. Uh, the next video, we're going to dive into sampling theorem and talk about Nyquist and some of his principles and how that relates to maybe music and telephone transmission and also obviously UT instruments. So stay tuned for that. I hope you enjoy it. And I'll probably get that posted sometime in the next week or so. Uh, take care and we'll see you next time.